It takes a certain combination of hard work and natural talent to become an international star in any given profession. Most people never reach that level of achievement, even if they've dedicated their whole lives to it. It's even rarer to find someone who's reached that success when they've only began their career at the age of 41. However, that's exactly what opera singer Betty Jones did when in 1971, she began singing professionally for the first time. Up until that point, she enjoyed life as a homemaker with her husband Doug, right here in Wilton, until a chance opportunity allowed her to quite literally find her voice and launched her to international renown. I'm Wilton Historical Society Associate Curator Nick Foster, and recently I had the opportunity to sit down with Betty's daughter, Janet Shipp, and her husband, Eugene Doug Jones, to discuss the fascinating and unconventional life of this longtime Wilton resident and opera star. They shared their thoughts on Betty's love of music, the many hours they spent at the Wilton Play Shop, as well as being the first African American couple to buy a home in Wilton in 1954. Betty Jean Powell grew up in New Jersey and was an art major at Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, New York. At Sarah Lawrence, she studied painting and sculpture as well as singing. It was there that Betty had one of her first opportunities to perform in an opera, when the music department staged a production of the Gershwin opera Porgy and Bess. Despite her college performance, Betty didn't actively pursue a singing career after graduation. She married engineer Doug Jones in 1954, and the pair moved to Wilton shortly after. Betty found time to continue singing with several community groups, even after she and Doug had two kids, Janet and Jeff. Betty became a mainstay at the Wilton Play Shop and in the Wilton Congregational Church Choir, and it was while performing at the church that Betty received her big break. And so Margaret, Margaret Gregory, she was married to Julian Gregory, uh, wanted Betty to sing for Georgiana Skank. And Georgiana said, you sing very well but you don't know how to sing. I'd like to teach you. Can you come to New York one day a week uh, and take lessons? She taught at the Manus College of Music. And so Betty went down one day a week uh, and her voice grew from the contralto to the soprano. And the first time she sang soprano in the Messiah at the Wilton Congregational Church. Linda Cabot Black had moved to town and the uh, Cabot family had financed the Boston Opera Company. So Linda heard Betty and Sarah Caldwell, who was a, the conductor of the uh, Boston Opera Company, and gave Betty two small roles in Louise up in Boston. That was her first opera. She was 41 years old. Pretty soon, Betty was finding roles throughout New York, Boston, Seattle, and more, and despite her relative inexperience. She came to New York, and her first opera, she sang the lead role in New York at Lincoln Center was Ballo and Mascara. And her manager then said, how many singers can come to New York and do lead, without any experience to do lead roles? And that, <laughs> that's what she did. For Doug, his wife's burgeoning career was a welcome new facet of a lifelong love of opera. My father, when he was in his 20s, when he started just working, you know, and out of college, uh, he had season tickets to the Met. So before oh, wow. he even met mom, he was an opera fan and loved opera. World War II with my severance pay. And I bought a season ticket to the Metropolitan Opera. The demand for Betty's talents soon went international. And throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Betty traveled the world to perform with her husband, Doug, at her side. Um, because now I have appreciation of how hard it was for mom with not only being able to sing high C and be a leading role, but 
all the languages she had to learn. She was always taking Italian, German. Um, she took Hebrew. Um, I mean, there were so many different, like French, and you have to sound good mm -hmm. and, and credible when you're singing in those languages. So not only was she learning the operas and having to sing high C, she had to take all these languages so she could speak them well. I remember one time she went out to Cincinnati when Janet got married, she had, she had to fly over to Europe because they knew that she would, uh, they could depend, depend upon her and not stop. She did come back in time to see me get married. <laughs> <laughs> While Betty's fame grew abroad, Wilton remained home sweet home. She continued to perform at the play shop and in the choir, and maintained strong connections with the people who helped her find her voice. I just always remember being there at rehearsals because back then they didn't get babysitters for everything. I think the kids played while the parents had rehearsal. There just was this wonderful group of people that had connections in Wilton, like, um, you know, Mrs. Black, who had connections with the Boston Opera. I mean, she, we are, we, her, I grew up with her kids. Mm -hmm. We all were living in Wilton and raising families. Wilton may have seemed like an unusual choice for the Joneses to call home when they first arrived in 1954. At the time, they were the first African-American family to purchase a home there at a time when the fight for civil rights was still ongoing. I wanted land and uh, the owner was mad at Wilton because he felt Wilton was, and he was Jewish, he was anti-Semitic. And he said, I'm gonna get back at Wilton. I'm gonna sell my house to this black family. The only time that uh, Jeff, my son, they wouldn't cut his hair. The barber wouldn't cut his hair. And so the minister of the Congregational Church uh, called Civil Rights Commission, and, uh, and he said, how come we won't cut his hair? He said, well, I, I thought if a black kid was in my chair, the other people wouldn't come. And so he did cut his hair, cut Jeff's hair. Betty and Doug both had strong connections to civil rights organizations. Betty's uncle, Walter White, was the executive secretary of the NAACP from 1929 to 1955. And Doug's father, Eugene, was a leader in the Brooklyn Urban League and helped found a chapter in New Jersey. When we got married, they said the NAACP and the Urban League, you know, are together. Despite the incident with the barber, the Joneses' experience in Wilton was a positive one, according to Doug, and in 1986, the Connecticut Commission of the Arts awarded Betty with the Connecticut Arts Award through a live TV broadcast from their home. I say it was very cool because I even visited the house when the cameras and they had the big trucks with, you know, you go into the truck and it has the, all the different cameras and camera one and camera two um, filming in the living room. And it was really, really cool to see the filming. And then I think we had to, the whole family drove to Hartford, right, Dad? Yeah, when she yeah. actually got the award, you know, yeah, on behalf the of the governor, uh, They presented it to her, which was all televised. The following year, 
jazz musician and Wilton resident Dave Brubeck received the same award. Dave had performed with Betty in the past and had a different idea for Betty's career. In fact, Dave used to say to Betty, uh, you, know, you, you know, give up opera. Let's just do a record together. They don't, no, didn't know that Betty could sing jazz. Betty continued to perform throughout the 1990s, always making sure to give back to the community that helped launch her to stardom. Even by the late 2000s, when she was no longer singing professionally, she was sure to find ways to support others in their dreams. But she also taught voice lessons out of the home too. And always supported if she was teaching a 13 year old voice lessons, if they got a, a job, you know, singing in the middle school play or musical, she would go and support her voice students. So they were always going to see performances to support and see how they sang because of the voice lessons. Betty Jones passed away in 2019 at the age of 89, leaving behind a legacy of significant contributions to the arts and the Wilton community. In 2014, with the help of her husband, Doug, she penned her autobiography, The Music in My Life, which provides wonderful insight into her unique life in her own distinct style. How much Wilton played a part in the success of such a talented and hardworking person such as Betty can be debated, but her family certainly has their opinions. And there was a wonderful group of very um, civil rights minded uh, um, and uh, art, the art community, the music community. Um, we had a wonderful life being in Wilton. Well, people have said to me, Dyke, you've lived all over the world. If you had your choice, where would you like to live? And I say, Wilton, Connecticut. 